Well, welcome to another edition of Driving the Sea Bus. I'm Scott McComb, your host, and uh, you know we're we're in this next series of uh, podcasts. Um, we're going to do some things a little bit differently, um, and we have a co-host uh, for the first time, surprise, on the, which is uh, Kaylin McComb. Hello, so, world. Uh, yeah, so Kaylin McComb is uh, related to me. Um, obviously, this is my daughter and uh, second generation community banker. She's also an Ohio State alumnus. Uh, majored in strategic communications. God, we love her, and she's a beautiful gal. We're here. Oh, stop. Yeah, she's getting married here in a couple of weeks They're as well. They're not paying me to so. be here, so yes, pay me in compliments. There you go. Appreciate it. So welcome, Kaylin. Thank you. Happy to be here. My, I've listened to a lot of podcasts, but this is my first time being on one, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> Tell you what, why don't you go ahead and welcome our guest today? Yeah, well, we are super excited today. Today we have um, a, a Heartland Bank board member. We have a good friend um, and a very cherished member of the Columbus community, uh, Mr. Greg Ubert of Crimson Cup. Well, hello. Happy to be here. Good Wonderful, to see you, Greg. Both. Yeah, good to see you. You know, um, uh, there's all kinds of things happening in our city and such, and it's a very entrepreneurial place. And you've been recognized, obviously, several times uh uh, we can't count on our fingers and toes how many times you've gotten an award from different places about uh, the different entrepreneurial activities and how your company started and all that. Why don't you give us a uh, just kind of a, a history, a little bit of Crimson Cup and yourself and uh, how you got to be in the coffee business? Well, sure. Well, this year we celebrated our 30th year in business. Wow. So wow. started in 1991. And it's uh, it's still just super exciting for me to be in the business and, and to, to continue to do, continue to innovate, do the things that it is that we're doing. Uh, so I, I came, I grew up in Columbus. So I, I went to what's now Thomas Worthington before Worthington. Of course, I'm going to age myself quite a bit during this conversation. But, you know, I was in Chicago working for a computer software company at the time. And I uh, just couldn't fall in love with computer software and decided to look around to see what my next thing was going to be and trying to find something that I love. Coffee or great coffee just really wasn't around. And, and having great coffee, you know, one of the reasons why I moved back to Columbus was, you know what, I bet you other people will like coffee for the taste, not just the caffeine, because really that's why people were consuming coffee it was more the caffeine than the taste. That was one. Two, I was looking at Columbus. Love Columbus. Want to get back to Columbus, Chicago. I went to school in Boston, which is great too. Chicago, another fantastic city. But I thought, you know what? There's no way Columbus is not going to be a great city with cuisine, with all the things that Columbus has to offer. So that was another reason. The, the third one really is uh, more from the community aspect because I was looking at where do I want to raise a family? And Columbus has so many great public high schools, uh, and that's just not fairly common around yeah. in large cities. And, you know, being here in so many great communities around central Ohio to be in, I thought, geez, it's a, it's a can't miss really to be here. And uh, so those are really the reasons why I moved back to Columbus to, to start Crimson Cup. I want to go back a little bit to when you said that you were doing computer software in the 1990s. Okay, that's pre-Y2K, which I don't even remember because I'm only 25. Tell me a little bit about that. What was that what was that like being in that in that industry during that time? It was it was pretty cool, really. I mean, it was there was, there was a lot of things happening. People were trying to figure out how to be more efficient. Uh, and certainly computer software allowed them, just like it's doing today, technology has just continues to get better and better. We're able to do so many different things now and, than we were before. So very similar in that aspect. So people were just coming around to it. And that was exciting, too, to be on that fairly new uh, cusp. But nonetheless, uh, when I decided to move back to uh, Columbus for coffee, you know, people did look at me strangely. You know, they're like, what are you doing? You know, because people knew where technology was going. Coffee at that time was like, uh, Greg, you might want to be put in a straitjacket. You know, <laughs> you're moving out of Chicago to go to Columbus. Well, I mean, how many stoplights do they have there? You, don't you know, it's that type the, of thing. Working with Fortran and COBOL was all that exciting and making the <laughs> cursor go around in a box and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, for me, that, that, that wasn't that exciting. But I was, I was more on the business development side, so they recruited me and uh, about 29 others. So at the time, the president's deal was to recruit Ivy League athletes to be the next 
uh, business development force. And so there's 30 of us going in uh, to this $250 million company. And quite frankly, we had a, we had a great time, but uh, there was a recession there, so cut 15 of us. I stayed and, and found a pathway through uh, there. Back to the strange, pe- strange part, uh, people do look at me strangely, and that's kind of normal because for people who are thinking outside the box. And uh, it's certainly something that I've learned that if I don't get a strange look, I know I'm not pushing the envelope. What's one thing that you've taken from software development and brought it over to coffee, to the coffee industry? Is there anything from your previous life that, that oddly enough, you've been able to use with, with your role today? Well, I, I think uh, more in, in the line of opportunity. There was a group of four of us, and there was really nothing for us to do. That's a longer story with Pansophic. But we were filing invoices in suits because that's the only thing they had for us to do. We decided to look for another opportunity inside the company, and so we did. We found this great opportunity to reach out to customers who weren't being touched and found that we could really impact them and obviously help ourselves too along the way. So there's plenty of opportunity inside large companies, inside small companies, and what I encourage my folks to do is to find it, right, because it's there. Now we can help them find it. Um, which is very important. Uh, by the same token, it's there for them to find too. So encouraging that entrepreneurial environment in, in our place is, is something that we'll continue to do. But what, but what you've done in your business as well, if I'm not mistaken, Greg, is shown your customers uh, how to be more efficient with what they do. So you set them up with their materials and everything else. You even set up where the m- machines are inside their shops, right, and teach them how to be more efficient. So you, so you have kind of implemented some of that uh, uh, computer-based uh, learning that you had early on into the coffee business. I think that that's, uh, again, thinking outside the box. I didn't realize that. So back in the 90s, what I learned was uh, people opening up businesses, strong entrepreneurs. We want to support entrepreneurs surely for everything we do. They just didn't have a strategy. They didn't, they didn't really know in the coffee industry what was going to make them money. What was going to keep them around? What was going to keep them strong? And so when I found this in the 90s, I'm like, holy cow, you know, we have to have a strong supply chain. Uh, We call it a relationship chain. But we have to have a a strong relationship chain because if they're successful, we're successful. So that's why we got into teaching and training. I mean, that's one of the things we do really, really well at Crimson Cup. We teach and train our customers how to be successful. And it's pretty simple. If they're successful, we're successful. Uh, yep. and, and so that's why we put so much into the training. That's why I wrote a book. That was not easy, but nonetheless. I had no idea you even wrote a book. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. you wrote a book. Yeah. What's the name of the book? It's called The Seven Steps to Success, How to Succeed in Specialty Coffee, and it's going to be soon in its third edition, so the foundational aspects of it are still around. So that's something that we um, have our people who want to open up a coffee house have them read. Because wow. we want to uh, attract the right people for us. And we also want to say this isn't easy. This is going to be hard. And if you're in it, we want, we need strong partners. Uh, and we can be a strong partner too. But it's a nice uh, combination. We both make the decision whether being an entrepreneur is right for them and it's right for us. That's too. incredible. Well, that's, I mean, a prospecting tool. You see, that's really a prospecting tool. It really is. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 uh, prospecting. Yeah. I mean, think about it here. If if they're unwilling to read the book, why spend any time with them? And then, and then if they don't agree with the concepts, now, you know, you're going to have a difficult customer, right? I mean, you know, you you hit exactly on it, right? Because (laughs) that's, that's, that's what I learned. That's what I learned in the nineties, right? I, I, I wanted a fun environment. It's kind of hard to have a fun environment when your customers are not really on the same page as you. And therefore, Kalen, we were just talking about that at breakfast, weren't we? Interesting. (laughs) Imagine that. (laughs) And if they're not on the same page, there's strife. And who wants strife? Really? I don't want my people to have strife. I don't want our customers to have strife. I want us working together for a positive solution that's going to benefit us all. So it's something to think about that above ourselves, that is, uh, but working together, we can come up with a better solution. So that's really why I wrote the book, because all the experiences I had in the 90s, just kind of learning, listening, understanding, and what did I want in our company in the future? Did I want, because we could have signed up a whole bunch of independent coffee houses. We only work with about 5%. And the reason is, is because we want to make sure that they're the right fit. 
because one of our core values is having fun. I yeah. love that. I love that you just said that because that's something that you know, Dad and I have been talking about for a long time, right? As I try to learn the trade and learn the business and and calm myself down when I can't make every single customer happy, right? And and it's the conversation of well, you don't need every customer to be successful. If you can be successful in the five percent or the one percent market share. That's golden. You you don't need to rule the world. We're not trying to be Japan here in World War II. You know, we're we're good. But real quick, I do want to plug your book. Where can our listeners find your book if they're interested in reading more? Well, the, the book is the book is online. Okay. Uh, so it's in crimsoncup.com. It's for those uh, future entrepreneurs. Somebody who wants to open up a coffee house. That's who it's meant for. Again, it's it's done really well for us because uh, with the end in mind, so start with the end in mind, what we want is a thriving, successful customer. And so we've just built that process uh, throughout. And that's it's 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 an easy book. It's not, it's not a hard book. I wrote it specifically just because there is a business plan in there, but I don't want our customers – we know that they're not going to become accountants. We don't want to become accountants. However, we do want them understanding what's going to drive their business. And so that's a piece of it as well as the other seven steps that we walk our customers through. Now, Greg, you, you do a lot. It sounds like you're a deep thinker. For somebody to very go deep. to that, very deep. and Very deep. <laughs> you know, for somebody to think about writing a book to train their customers for tryouts, that's really the way I – that's just – I just had a major epiphany today. So that's that's awesome. I'm going to try to see how I can work with that in my business. Um but you have to um, obviously attract. You probably put a lot of thought into how to attract and retain uh, people that then can work in that environment and and charm those customers and still grow with the company. Tell us about uh, your outlook on your people. You know, I, I think we're going to continue, like I said before, about just making sure that they have the opportunity. As I view my job is is finding their strength. We can find their strengths, whether it's myself, my managers, or whatever, and then putting them into that sweet spot, right? So it's you know some people call it putting the right people on the right find seat the right of the seat bus, on the bus, right? And and what that means is to me anyway is you know everybody has their strength, and to be able to put them in that strength is is you know only supports the team. And uh, that's a hard part. That's been a hard part for me, certainly, being an entrepreneur, finding the right people and putting them in the right seats. Uh, and, that, and that'll continue to go on. But I think that that's very, very important. So with our folks, the person who works what we, with what we call our seven steps, people who want to open up, open up a coffee house, he's awesome. He knows that we're looking for the right fit. And think about that in business development. There's a lot of business development that goes out and, hey, find anybody, bring them on. Well, we have to actually do the opposite and say, hey, we're looking for a total fit here because we know that that's going to be best for the organization and what we believe in the future. What, and do you do, did, do, I'm sorry. Do you do yep. any pre-qualification for those folks, like personality testing or is it just a normal interview process? Do you take them to two or three interviews or what, what do you do to make sure that you're getting the right people on the team before you can figure out what seat they're going to have on the bus. Well, I, I think that that's just something that we learn through experience. Just what questions are people asking? You know, what are what what are, what are their interests? And and again, it's just kind of finding the right mix. So if you're sitting down with somebody and and they may be a nice person, but you're at the end of the day, you may be like, huh? You know, I just there's something that maybe we're not going to. Uh, you know, go out every night type of thing, right? And, and I think we look at it from the position of there's nothing if you're asking, hey, what exactly do we have set up? There are no personality tests. There aren't any, hey, can we check your finance? There, there's none of that. And, and because we want it, we're more interested in the relationship aspects because we believe we found that if we can get there, then that's a winner. Whereas before, I think people were looking at this as a business relationship, which means I win, you may lose, or however they look at a business relationship, that's a little bit different for us, right? Because we're more in the relationship. If we can figure out that piece, it's a winner. If we can't, it's not. You know, you've talked a lot about finding the right people and what it takes to to have the right person on the bus. Uh, I think almost every single industry has seen over the last year a problem with retention, right? What have you guys been doing at Crimson Cup to retain those key employees and or what would your advice be to business owners that are having trouble retaining those employees? You know, I think for us, it's about continued education. Uh, making sure that they're in the right place. Certainly compensation has has a piece to that too. Sure. Uh, no question about it. 
and 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 making this uh, fun, giving them guidance, I think is and bringing them in to where the company's going and what it is that we're about. So we want to make sure that our customers know who we are. You know, what are we after? Right. For for one of the things that I become really important to me is our relationship with farmers, uh, and and all that we do in different farms. There's a ton of stuff that we're doing innovation wise, and I just kind of scratch my head and say, huh. You know, uh, not that we're unique. I'm not saying that. And we're rare because we're doing a whole bunch of different things with farmers and the farming communities that I just think maybe should have been done before. But it's kind of like what I found, too, is the simplest things are the most often overlooked. And so we look at those simple things and how can we do that? For instance, teaching and training our customers to be successful. Well, people thought that that was really different. And I was like, well, why? I don't, I don't understand, but that's okay. You know, when we're working with farming and farming communities and doing all the stuff that we're doing then, like setting up labs in Peru, cupping labs, so that they can taste the same thing. I just talked to our sustainability director. He's talking to Uganda and, and doing the same thing. He's shipping them coffee from Peru and Colombia so they can, they've never tried coffee from another part of the world. And how does that operation even start? I mean, how do you even go about setting setting up that relationship between a different country to create a lab to be able to expand your footprint? How where do you even start with that? Well, we 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 travel a bit. You know, it's very important to see our customers or see uh, people in our relationship chain. So that something where people looked at me funny. They're like, Greg, you don't have to travel. We do it all for you. I said, well, I, I know we don't have to. Well, it could be fun. But it, 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 could it, be enlightening. It, it is fun. How do you build relationships through a factory rep too? Then they own the relationship, right? And you don't, and you can't have any, you can't put your fingers all over it, you know, and that's what you want to do, right? You want to get right. into every nook and cranny. That's exactly right. And so those are the things that we come to the table with that is is really interesting, really fun, enjoyable for us, and it will continue to be because uh, establishing relationships around the world is 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 awesome because most people are truly wonderful. How many countries really. are you guys in right now? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know, like twenty some. Wow, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, twenty, uh, and then you go. Uh, on a road, rotating basis to them or just uh, we do probably we do like I still do some and then I have a couple other couple other uh, cuppers that's what we call them a couple other folks cuppers. do that yeah nice yeah well, maybe we can talk a little bit about innovation because it's you know you are bringing simple things to light in an industry that is really commoditized right I mean so you are just uh, like banking yeah, exactly how about that that's <laughs> kind of where I was heading is that you know we have a concept uh, of everything speaks. Um, uh, there's a gentleman named Snow that wrote a book called The Customer Lens. And what he talks about there is that, um, you know, we are uh, industries and, and just individual companies get to a rudimentary point where they're doing the same thing every day and they forget, you know, they don't they don't have another customer, you know, view of how they how they're perceived. And so we try to we challenge our people every day to kind of step out of the box and look back and say, you know, if I was a customer, how would this look to me or how, how would our branch appeal or how was I greeted or or what does that statement say or, you know, to me if I was a customer, not as, not as a banker, but as a customer. You don't see that a lot in the business world um, of how that looks. You know, this snow guy worked for uh, Disney, so he was actually a uh, – he was Captain Nemo. <laughs> Captain the <laughs> Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Have you seen that movie? Oh, wow, Katie? I have not. It's an oldie yeah. but a goodie. Yeah, you ought to probably get it. It's a Disney. I know I you're remember a Disney. I, I had one time when I was in school, I actually tried to check that book out of the library, thinking that it was about like mermaids and sea fish, and then I realized what it was actually about. And mm. needless to say, I never read it. Yeah, well, it's a good movie if you ever want to is check there, it is out. Is there an so. audio book or podcast? Um, on probably, it? No, probably not. No. But anyway, he he went on to be the director of marketing at at Disney. And so that's the concept they talked about is that uncovering the stuff that's right in front of you is it's it's not very hard. You just have to train your your people and your and your discipline to to see it and make it on a regular basis that you are you know ripping off the layers of the onion and taking a look for of what really is happening here in front of you from the customer's point of view. Oh, absolutely. And and I think uh well, I mean it's kind of how I found Heartland Bank, quite frankly. My board uh cuz this was during the uh, great recession. 
And the company, the bank that I was with for a long time, making all the payments, doing everything, they ran into some trouble and uh, they didn't want us as a customer. And my board said, that's okay. Find a bank like you. I'm like, that is weird because I viewed it as a commodity, right? I mean, that's that's crazy. But a bank like me, I've never heard that before. But it's interesting. And that's uh, – I did some interviews and uh, certainly found Scott and he was – Right on target. I was like, okay, this this person I can have a conversation with. It's it's not a business relationship. Of course, it's a business, but there's more to it behind that. It's a business relationship. Is relationship. The key word. You're exactly right. Yeah, super. So that's that's how it happened. Yeah, My- relationship. It's all about you know all business is about relationships. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're in banking or you know I was in the security business for a while. You know, for ten years, I guess. Uh, of my career. And it, it's all about relationships. Uh, you can get a free pass sometimes if you screw up, if you have relationships. You, there's other ways that you can also shine for your customers if you have a relationship. You know, they're willing to call you, bear their own and say, hey, this is my problem. How do we help? And and, uh, and they're very open and honest with you and you're able to help them. You know, uh, so uh, the level of business uh, uh, skips to the level and speed of trust. Trust, right. And that's what it's all about. That's what relationships create. Switching gears a little bit, you know, I, I want to get to kind of the meat and bones of, of how your strategy has changed over the years. Um, you know, I think that you kind of made a good point earlier about switching from focusing on I'm drinking coffee for caffeine because I'm not a human until I've had my cup of coffee versus I'm drinking coffee because I enjoy the taste, kind of like craft beer, right? That hasn't been something that's that's always been there. I feel like it personal Kaylin opinion. Uh, there really hasn't been this push on coffee. It, my opinion, the last, you know, five to 10 years is really when it's become this thing. Starbucks has become more popular. There's all these different cold brews and, um, you know, all, all this, these different products. How has that changed the way that you've kind of approached <laughs> the marketplace? If it has, you could say, no, it hasn't. I remember now before you answer, Greg, just remember, <laughs> she, you started five years before she was born doing this. Okay. <laughs> It's just, it's so, been around for a little bit of time now, Kaylin. That's correct. My question stands. Okay. That's a good question, Thank by the you. way. I'm old enough now to look at it in decades, right? So my first decade was really learning specialty coffee, trying to teach that uh, what is specialty coffee because nobody knew. Everybody thought coffee came in a jar or a packet back then. So I had to teach that to people and as, as well as teaching our customers how to how to be successful too. In the, in the second decade is really building those relationships with farmers. So I, what I learned was I can't do everything at once, or we as an organization cannot Rome do everything at once. not built in a day. Right? So we had to do some some different things. And and then the, the really the third decade, since I had traveled the globe and stuff like that, and I've met coffee roasters around the globe, I've never met a coffee roaster that said they don't have the best coffee in the world. That I probably will never happen. So what we did, what I decided to do was we needed to have others, professionals in the industry, say that we have the best. And so that's where we spent time on really making sure that we could access great coffee and then roast great coffee. So, you know, view it as cooking. If I were given the same ingredients as, I don't know, who's your favorite chef, Kaylin? Bobby Flay. Bobby Flay. I should take that back. Pretty Gordon Ramsay. Shame on Ramsey. me. Ramsey, pretty good, right? So think about this. If I were given the same ingredients as Gordon Ramsay, the chances of me coming up with something great that he would are pretty small, right? Well, I, with, I would probably say attitude, I, I would probably, absolutely it I'd is. probably say I came, I'd come up with a, an F product and he'd come up with an A product. I'm sure of it. You know, we all have. And that's, uh, that's right. And it's similar to coffee roasting, right? Just, so just because somebody starts out with the exact same ingredients does not mean it's going to come out fantastic, right? So we're really good at accessing great coffee and then roasting it or cooking it. And so we spent time on that. That's why we've won the uh, Roaster of the Year. That's, that's, a, uh, a centri- uh, that's a North American award that we won. That's a big won. deal. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal for us because it's it's not only based on your the best coffee because there is a whole bunch of submittals for that. It, it's based on how we do business. So that one we really value. The Golden Bean, so it's the largest coffee competition in the world. We won the Golden Bean Trophy. Wow. There is a trophy for this. I, I have to tell people, and I you, know, you can come by yeah. in, our, in our innovation lab. You can snap. You can you know take a photo, you know because people are interested in. 
that type of thing. Well, there's a giant you know? bean in Chicago. Millions <laughs> Maybe. of people go to every year. Maybe. I don't know. I think there attraction. is. I mean, you, you'd take a picture with, an, uh, with the Ohio State National Championship, wouldn't you? You would. You know? Yeah. Why was, not the Golden Bean Award? I, for why God's not? Sake. I was with my son in Boston, and we had a chance to take a picture with the uh, World Series because they won the World Series that year. That's a pretty good trophy to take. Yeah, the Golden Bean is pretty much right if up there. If you partner up with the biggest you. ball of twine, then you guys got to, you know, we'll have to open up extra shops and build a parking lot, I think. Don't you think? For I think, people to come in and I see. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. We it's a big that. deal. That's have a, you ever been to you his, uh, Kaylee, have you ever been to his, uh, I have not. his laboratory? I have it's not. a, what do you call it? It's a coffatorium. Yeah, it's our innovation lab. It's a fun place where we can do a whole bunch of different different types of things. But I guess where I was going with that too, Kalen, is that coffee has become more and more partic- particular, sure, more and more advanced. So technology has allowed us to communicate with our farmers. So we weren't able to do that, wasn't able to do that in the 90s, probably 2000s, as easy as we're, we're able to do that now. The reason why that's important is we can actually get the pre-ship samples from them and taste it and then tell them to do something different in mm-hmm. the process yeah. if if we think it needs to. Sure. So we can actually affect the taste of the coffee that we're getting because we can communicate now with our farmers directly. And that is really cool. I so mean, important. I have a, a, a know a couple people. I shouldn't say I have a couple friends. I know a couple people that are my age kind of exploring the coffee industry right now. And, you know, I think something that has been very much on the minds of a lot of people in my generation is they want to do business with people who are doing good in the world, right? They want to have some sort of social cause behind it, um, you know, whether it's a global or local cause. And so one of the focuses of, of you know, these these people that I know that are in the looking into the coffee industries, like you said, sustainability for those farmers, right? Yes, we have this giant industry here in America and it's great. Everybody's getting their $5 Starbucks coffee or their, what is it, like $3.50 amazing crimson cup coffee. They want to know that the farmers behind those beans are being taken care of. What does that look like on your end? You know, how much communication? It sounds like you're having quite a bit of communication, you know, with every person in the step of that process. But what does that mean to you as, as the uh, business owner? Yeah, what it means to us is when we go in, we, we look at a few different levels. So environmental, mm-hmm. because we want to make sure that they're treating the environment right. And with coffee, you, that's a piece of it. Uh, social level, because most communities that we go into have a lot of need. So pre-COVID, uh, I was down with customers. We're in Honduras. We're building a house for a coffee picker and his family, which is really cool. Yeah, that's And incredible. so, you know, awesome. whether it's water filtration projects, you know, uh, education, I mean, just really whatever the uh, – Whatever the community thinks that they need, you know, we'll try to provide from a social level. And then the, 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 I think being my major was economics, right? So the best thing is from an economic level. So, which is really interesting to me because most of our farmers have never had like a contract that would say, look, if you make a better coffee, we're going to pay you more for it, which is our offering to them as well as environmental and social. They haven't had this offering. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like okay, well, yeah. If you make a better coffee, we're gonna and we're gonna show you how to do that because a lot of them don't know. Which is another thing you'd think. Oh, everybody no, no, they don't. A lot of them don't. At least the ones that we meet. And then uh, so we can show them how to make a better coffee. Which again, that's the sustainability piece because sure. I believe that people always want quality. Well, and you're building your right. own industry up by helping not only train the people that you have here in your shops, but by also helping the producers learn how to grow better coffee beans. You're, well, exa- a, you're exactly right. Well, it's a byproduct of just the fact that they, you know, they're, they're people of very, very modest means, mm-hmm. right? And so it's not really about getting the best of something. It's about getting something. That's right. And so they've really not they're, had the concept of trading up or something like that, right? Because of the very agronomic environment they live in and then the fact that you know basic human needs are a lot different in honduras than they are you know maybe in the united states or someplace else around the country yeah, i mean I, I kind of look at probably how farming was here in the u.s in the late 1800s right. right very proud people hard work no different than than the coffee communities that we work with they love they love doing what they do they love farming and so it's just never been super profitable for them sure you know, and we're when we're coming in saying, "Look, we value what it is that you're doing," and they love they love that. Well, not and everybody can they? be a farmer. Right? I mean, that's one not thing. Farmers can, love what they right. do, and you have to love what you do if you're a farmer. Because if there's so, I I'm, I'm you can't see me because it's a podcast, but here are the air quotes. I'm a farmer now. I farm that's chickens. Right. I have forty. 
six chickens. And dogs and cats. Wow. And dogs and cats, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and there's one thing that I learned real quick when we moved out there to the lovely city of Mount Vernon is that you truly are, it's, it's a race against daylight. There are certain things that you have to do between the time the sun comes up and the sun goes down. You can't do it when you can't plow your fields when it's dark outside or when it's raining or if it's too wet after it rained. You I mean, have to love what you do because it can be a grueling job. And if you don't get it done, you're not making any money. And it's not just you're not making any money that month. You're not making any money that year. Right. That's yeah, right. And the animals die. Correct. If they don't have feed or water or Correct. what have you. If you don't take care of them. There's lots of responsibility. It's a it's self-starting business for sure. Just, uh, you know, the ultimate entrepreneur is a farmer and uh, usually they have five or six businesses running on the farm too so right. hey greg tell us a little bit about the future so you know you've come a long way we're now thinking of business in decades uh you're really providing a lot of value on the heartland bank board we appreciate your service there tell us what the future lies for crimson cup and greg what do you see happening over the next uh five to ten years I think for us is uh, looking at it and seeing how many people can we engage with what it is that we're doing. We're going to be getting out there more. We're, you know, our brand is still the same. We still believe in the same thing and we're just repositioning it a little bit. One of the things that I thought about was uh, focus on good. So we're going to be getting that out there more and more because I think it's very relevant now is the focus on good. So if I believe that you're good and the person sitting across from me, person I'm having conversation with is good as opposed to maybe not so good, it's going to totally change the way I view that conversation. Whereas if we're focusing on good, which is I've traveled the world, I believe very strongly that people are good throughout the world and here too, all over the place, right? So if that's true, I believe that that's true. And if we can look at that and get others to look at that too, that could quite possibly change change things for the better. Well, it, changes the, what it changes the way people think about things because just to your point, when you're when I'm having a conversation with somebody, but in my mind, I think that they're a bad person, they could tell me that I look beautiful and that I've lost weight and that they're so happy for me. And I'm going to think, well, you're lying because you're a bad person and I already know that about you. If you change the lens you're looking through, that it changes your entire perspective of the world. I feel like that's some, one thing. If there's one thing that you know, could help the the divisiveness in the world today. Mm -hmm. It's it's that if everybody just took a step back and had more of a positive outlook on everything. Yeah, there's a you were a very early adopter. Sounds like decades ago to uh, what is now being uh, putting on public companies. Uh, that's ESG. So uh, environmental uh, uh, environmental sustainability and governance um, is something that's very very big right now on Wall Street. You know, BlackRock had their uh, uh, had their letter come out this fall, um, this past fall, talking about uh, how they're going to be looking at the disclosures more carefully and scrutinizing public companies that they put their capital in to make sure that they're they're adhering to ESG. And so, um, you know, and, and there's been a lot of pushback from uh, from uh, certain areas about ESG, but um, you know, put it in the proper context, it's something we probably should be focused on. You know, from the from the impetus of our of our businesses. So that's great to hear that you're, you're doing those things. I agree too. You know, it's uh there's so many people out there in the world, uh, the, the media, I've got to remember dirty laundry, right? Uh, there's a song about that. I think by, I forget who sings it. Yeah. Don Henley. That's right. And so it's all about, uh, uh, you know, the media just wants to push, you know, news and eyeballs and everything else. And if they sit there and talk about all the good things, how many people are going to tune in? Um, yeah, but there are inherently, I, I agree. There's more good in this world than there is bad and evil. Good will always win over evil. And uh, so if you want to get more on that, why just, you know, come on back uh, on Sunday and we'll, we'll preach some more. <laughs> or just turn on the Star Wars saga and you'll learn that too. Exactly. Yeah. We could, the force is real. It really is. Uh, and it really is. And it's about, and it's built through relationships uh, the, and, and, uh, and establishing the speed of trust. I have one more pressing okay, question yeah. that pressing. might be the most important that we've asked today. It probably is. What is your favorite brew from Crimson Cup? Uh, so many, but I'll tell you one, right? Because it's one of our farmers in Guatemala, and people at Crimson Cup call it call it Greg's Coffee because it's a very full body, chocolatey. And this guy Mario is the farmer and tremendous person. He has uh, uh, he's an engineer by trade, so he's divided his farm up into very 
very cool little, each one has its own different thing. And he named one of them El Cadejo, Finca El Cadejo, which means uh, they have uh, there in Guatemala and I think Central America too. Cadejo means it's a, a mythical dog that walks you home if you've had too much to drink. How about that? Huh. Where do you buy one of those? <laughs> yeah. How about that? That's pretty good, right? It is. Uh, for those who imbibe a little bit, you know, have a drink or two. Uh, for me, it's just a phenomenal coffee. I just love it. And there's so many different ones that I, I'm i very fortunate. My folks are great. I, I don't do anything. They kind of drop drinks on my desk just about every other day. And I'm like, oh, my, this is incredible. You know, at Easton, you know, our new store at Easton, there was a strawberry shortcake latte. I would never oh think to gosh. make it, but we create everything. Everything is natural over there at Easton at our Crimson store. And it was, I never would have thought, you know, it's awesome. You know, and that's what I love, just the innovative drinks that we're making so over there. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to see. Uh, my favorite coffee that you make is Jungle Love. And I buy it by the box and I ship it to Bonita Springs when I'm there or wherever. I got to have my jungle love uh, throughout the day. So maybe I can meet that. I'd love to meet the farmer that makes the jungle love bean. That would be that would be pretty cool. Uh, put his picture up that'd on my be, wall. And, you know, that'd be great. You know, we we, t- we take customers, we take students down. Uh, it's it's a wonderful opportunity. So we'd love to, I'd love to do more and more and more of that. That'd that be, great. be great. Can you get there by Catamaran where they make Jungle Love? Uh, you probably could. Okay. Well, yeah. I, May not see I, you for a while, but, you know, <laughs> plan it now. You could be there next year. What maybe. else is new? We'd never That's, know he's gone <laughs> if he has Wi-Fi. What, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> Follow-up question. I think I know the answer, but if there's one thing I've learned, never assume. Do you take coffee or uh, sugar or cream? I do not. I do not. Now, if I'm having, if it's a very wintry day and I have dark roast or something like that, and I feel like a dark roast, I will put a little, Just a little cream bit. in that. Okay. But that's about it. All right. Yeah. Interesting. What are you, any questions you'd have for for your host today? Well, I think you've uh, you've pulled it off here pretty good. You know, first one in how long? This has been uh, first one in, I don't it's know. The, this years. is probably the post COVID uh, era, I would say. And I, I, I think it's a, you know, it's a good combo. You two, I think, you know, you got the, huh. I don't know. I was getting some looks from the, her earlier when I was calling yeah, her out well, on the some good news is that it's history. podcast. So if I reach over and smack him, nobody can see me. Yeah, and we can actually uh, <laughs> cut that out too, if we had to, but <laughs> no, it's going to be interesting as we move forward, you know, keeping, uh, continuing to uncover, um, entrepreneurialism and people doing good out in the community and and uh, and and uh, all the things that make uh, business in Columbus, Ohio, a, a special place. So um, I, I appreciate you coming out today. Uh, again, congratulations on on all your success, um, Kaylin. What do you think about your first uh, podcast it here was with fun. the old man? What do you it think? was super fun. I think that you know we're getting our flow down. We'll get there. We got to figure out you know our navigating our way through those pauses and. Probably just change the guest is what I'm thinking. That's probably a good, good one. Don't you? I don't know. I think there? next time we need to have one of those cold <laughs> brews. Well, I don't know. Well, we that... could actually sit here and drink coffee and see how quickly we talk after 45 minutes. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I good. drink like five cups of coffee. A day. It's, I shouldn't even say that. You, I had my doctor ask me one time, like, how how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? And I'm like, as many as I can. What kind of question is that? That's like, healthy, I don't. You know, you know, I mean, doesn't me? everybody know it's how healthy? How dare you? That's a personal it's, question. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I had to wait on you 35, 40 minutes. What's the what's your next question? Right. Yeah, doctor. Uh, well, thanks, Caitlin. Good to have you no, here. No, super and welcome excited to, to be show. here. the show. Look forward to working with you, not only at the bank, and but also here on the podcast. So, Full um, disclosure to everybody, next time I'm here, my name will not be Caitlin McComb. It will be Caitlin Bucklew, because I will be married by the next time we are recording a podcast. That's so. right. Good Don't deal. be too surprised. It's still, it's still the same old me. He's a good guy. Congratulations, Kalen. Uh, yeah, I took him to the ultimate interview. I took him turkey hunting. So I got to have a gun aimed at him for about uh, 48 hours in the <laughs> woods. No one would have ever known. Uh, up I there made in sure he knew that. New York and Candor, New York at Turkey Trot Farm. And uh, he came back alive. He did so. come back alive. And, so I knew he was the one. Uh, and we had a good time. So thanks, Kalen, for being on the show Happy and, to be and, uh, here. and hosting. And uh, Greg, I appreciate all you do. Congratulations on your success. Folks, that's a, a wrap here on another edition of Driving the Sea Bus. Make it a great day.